So in this video I'm going to show you how I make a two-handed greatsword for LARP. To begin with, you need a, a thicker core than you would need for something smaller like a dagger or a single-handed sword. I think I'm using 12mm here, but it could be anything kind of above 10mm. I think for my normal one-handed weapons I use about 8mm. I start off with a template, um, which is always good obviously when you're making any kind of large weapon. This, uh, this means that you can kind of check the length as you're going along and check proportions, which I think is quite important when you've got big weapons like this. I think it's worth having a template when you do any kind of weapon, because uh, this means that you can kind of keep on top of your proportions. So wrap tape around the uh, bits that I'm going to cut. This just helps keep the fibers together as you're cutting them. And then you want to use a Dremel or a bit of sandpaper or a file to just smooth out that kind of sharp edge at the end of the, uh, the core. Then this is one of the most important steps is to uh, sand the entire rod. This helps in encourage adhesion to the foam. It reduces the chance of the core coming away from the foam on the inside of the weapon, which I think is the main issue that things deteriorate over time. Um, this is something that obviously weapon checks look for quite keenly. Now I'm just gonna pin the template to the foam. Uh, this helps keep keep in the same place while I'm just tracing it with a with a sharpie here. I'm doing a white sheet for the core. This is, I mean, partly because it makes it a bit easier when you're sanding it to know where you're kind of going with each depth. But it doesn't need to be white. I'm just using white foam here because it's the material that I've got. Again, it's medium density, kind of the same as, as the other stuff. I'll I'll share links to where I get all my products from in the in the description. And then come in again with a core, again just to check the size, just check everything is uh, is measuring up okay. It's worth doing this throughout the project. Then use a sharp knife to carefully cut along the lines. The sharper the knife the better. So either you can kind of change blades regularly or uh, you can get a blade sharpener and just keep on top of sharpening that blade. Cool. Uh, we're going to kind of repeat the process now for the three layers. I think I'm going to make this uh, this weapon three layers thick like most other weapons. Again, just pinning. Now I'm using this as the stencil because it's a bit more firm, a bit more uh, true to, to size. And I'm just going to pin this to the foam and trace around it. Repeat the process um, for the two layers of the black foam. I'm trying to save as much foam as possible here by kind of cutting them as close together, but you are gonna end up with a bit of wasted foam in between. I don't throw away my wasted foam, I just hold on to it, but it does accumulate. You do end up with a lot of offcuts and a kind of a lot of like, oh, I'll use that for a later project, but you never get around to doing it. Well, you may, you may. There's my three layers of foam cut. Um, just gonna check the sizes with each of them. It's probably worth marking at this point your front and back so that you don't end up putting glue on the wrong side, but I think I did that off camera. Um, now I'm just marking kind of the tips of my core and I'm gonna mark roughly where the core is gonna need to be cut out from uh, this central piece of foam. Before I do that, I need to pop nibs on each end of the core. This helps prevent it from bursting through the, uh, the foam over, over time and makes the weapon much more durable. I'm doing this with a kind of little bit of foam on the end. I'm using contact cement to glue that foam to the end, back and front. It's worth doing back and front. And then I'm using Kevlar, which is quite fiddly to cut um, because it's so fibrous and obviously it's designed to be quite strong. But yeah, bit of Kevlar, again, contact cement, and then wrap around this kind of tip where it meets the, meets the core. And this helps prevent it obviously from coming unstuck over time. Uh, contact cement is a pain in the ass, so it's worth putting this on, on some uh, uh, greaseproof paper to help prevent it from sticking to your workbench. But yeah, there we go, press nice and tight. Cool, so that's uh, worth checking now against the core and obviously adding that little extra bit there for where the foam is on that core. Um, same as the, uh, the, the base end. And then what you want to do is cut out that central section of the central piece of foam so that you can kind of 
pop in your core. Uh, just do a dry fit here, just to check that you've got enough uh, got enough of a give in there. This is a bit of a fiddly bit. This is just apply the uh, contact cement to the core. You can get this on your fingers. It's not going to kill you, but uh, it probably would be worth wearing gloves. Uh, makes this process a little bit easier. And then obviously getting glue on the inside of this foam core is a little bit more tricky. But yeah, let that cure for 10 minutes before it gets tacky. And then very carefully start with the tip or base. Start with one end and then go to the other end. Make sure that meets. When you're pressing the foam to the core, you're going to get some buckling and some kind of like waves. So it's worth working your way up gradually and kind of forcing that that shape onto the onto the core there and try and pick it up as you go because the core here is uh, slightly thicker than the foam so you want to try and make sure that foam is central to that core uh, which means that you can't just kind of rely on the flat bench that you're you're pressing together on. And then again Kevlar fantastic material very lightweight very thin it's worth just popping a bit of Kevlar on the tip again with contact cement make sure it's tacky and give it a nice press down um, again, this just stops the core from splitting left or right along the kind of length of that weapon popping through and causing any any injuries. I'm using a bit of tape here, a bit of uh, hockey tape, um, just on top of that Kevlar. Um, not necessary at all here, but it's just an extra, extra bit of thickness and a bit of protection. Same with the base, do the same. And because this has got a particularly large kind of grip and guard, it's worth treating it a bit like a kind of uh, axe head and adding a bit of a core uh, strength to that uh, so that it doesn't tear. If it gets caught, caught in a shield, it's caught another weapon, uh, this helps prevent it from tearing. It's got a lump of Kevlar in the middle of it. Cool. And then you want to wear a uh, respirator here because obviously you're using a huge amount of this contact cement, which is a pain in the ass and it stinks. But yeah, you want to coat both uh, sides of the foam and then carefully work your way from one end all the way down, making sure that your, uh, your two pieces of foam match up as close as possible. Then you want to give it a nice press with your hands and a press with the rolling pin. This helps uh, activate the, the contact cement. Um, so if you can kind of force this activation, um, you're going to get a much stronger bond. And then, uh, yeah, so rinse and repeat. Do the same for the other side, working your way down from the base or the tip, one end to the other, basically, so that you're uh, nice and uh, in, nice and aligned. And again, activate it by pressing it really hard with the rolling pin and pressing it hard. Now, what you don't want to do is jump straight into sanding at this stage. It's probably best to let that contact cement cure overnight. So what I tend to do now, um, didn't used to do this, but if I, what I do is I clamp the, uh, the main area of the weapon between two boards and then press it with some clamps and then I kind of leave it for a good at least 10 hours and so yeah this is the next day I'm aware that I'm wearing the same t-shirt now I'm going to mark along where I need to kind of sand up to in order to get that tapered blade edge so kind of doing this freehand and then when I'm looking at it now I'm thinking maybe it's not thick enough to uh to get that proper taper to make it safe because the core is quite a lot thicker here so there's going to be a point where you've got 10 mil foam on the edge between that and the core it's probably going to be fine but I did want a bit more thickness to this uh to this weapon so what I've done here is I'm tracing around this, the, the blade again I'm quite thin foam here this is two mil thick I believe and I'm just going to add a kind of strip down the middle of either side and also cut out the uh, the grip here in the guard just to make it a bit more kind of rounded um, so it needs a little bit more thickness not too much and then again yeah with the uh, contact cement again and best to work from one side to the other gradually trying to keep that core straight again activating it by pressing it hard so now what I've done is I've cut down the kind of length of the sword and any kind of areas that need to be tapered with a knife and this gives me a kind of rough shape um, which is saves a lot of the sanding but obviously there's going to be a lot of sanding now. Yeah, not really sure what happens with the uh, camera here but it's kind of gone like 
pretty weird and like slow-mo. I think it's to do with my light settings, I apologize. Um, hopefully it kind of figures itself out. But yeah, basically you have to work your way around. Sanding and sanding and sanding. There's not really much I can say about this part. The Dremel's great here because obviously there's lots of curved edges for effect on the uh, blade. So I can't do this on the uh, bench sander, so it has to all be done by hand. As you're going along, it's probably worth cracking the hoover out every now and again, making sure those particles are cleaned up as best as possible. And then you can come in with a hand sander as well to get a nice kind of edge, flatter edge to that sword. And kind of tidy everything up. Hit it with a heat gun, that kind of uh, locks that foam, it kind of closes all those pores on the foam, makes it a much smoother finish. And then I'm going to do some detailing. I didn't film myself doing the detailing, but it's each to your own here. This is kind of however you want to add to the weapon or... I didn't really plan this stage, I just kind of went for it. So obviously I've used the Dremel to kind of sand in some areas. It's going to be a Crimson Reaper's sword, so it's obviously got skulls on it. And then I've made the grips kind of bones. Um, yeah, I just kind of went for it. And then this stage is obviously very important as well. This is going to be mixing that contact cement uh, with some thinner. And this is, I, I just kind of mix it by eye. It's like roughly one to one, slightly less thinner than there is contact cement usually. And then you just want to kind of slap this over your entire weapon. Um, and again, this helps bind the le next layers to that foam for a nice, uh, nice adhesion. Um, yeah. So I've sprayed it black uh, with the Air, air, mm, airbrush? Paint gun? Anyway, I've sprayed it rather than painted it because I wanted a smoother finish. Um, and yeah, I've done a one coat of silver latex on the blade. But yeah, let's uh, go into a bit more detail about painting. So I just mix latex with silver here. So rather than just get used to airbrush all the time because it's kind of sprays latex everywhere. It's fine for like the base coats because every weapon's the same. I can do a batch. Um, but then to paint the kind of detail and colors, I, I, I tend to do this by hand. And I do this by just kind of slapping the latex and paint. And then I use a sponge just to kind of dab it. This kind of prevents the, the kind of paint brush streaks. Smooths it out a little bit. Gives it a bit of a texture actually as well, which is quite nice. A bit of a finish. So the light catches it in slightly different ways. Cool, then you hang it up to dry, or put it somewhere to dry. And then I'm gonna do some gold, and this is just to demonstrate how I mix up that um, latex paint with the um, flexi paint. Um, I just add a load of gold flexi paint to the latex. I'm also adding some um, of my miniature paints here as well, which is gold, to try and get a bit more of a kind of a warmer gold color, a bit more of a kind of uh, a deeper gold. I'm doing a test here just on the lid just to see how that comes out. I kind of like it, uh, but I think it does need a bit more gold paint in it. You can add at most kinds of acrylic paint because acrylic has a little bit of flex to it, but obviously when it's with it, with that latex, it gets a good mix and obviously the latex helps it remain flexible. And because I'm not doing a huge area with this particular one, it doesn't matter having too much paint in it. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's how I mix up my latex paint. And then here we go. This is uh, kind of roughly getting there with the colors. So a bit of gold detail, which is quite nice. Yeah, it's so very big. Very big weapon. Now I'm going to do the grip. Um, I bought a load of sample offcuts uh, from, I think, Amazon. I'll put a link down in the description. I don't think it may have been eBay, but I'll put a link anyway. Um, you get lots of different sample cuts of fabrics, uh, leather fabrics, for like, barely anything, which is great. So I'm going to go with either a red or a kind of crimson here, because obviously we're part of the Crimson Reapers. This uh, weapon's going to go to a Crimson Reaper. So red makes sense. Um, so I'm get rid of... Just do a kind of little fit test just to see. I think I preferred the kind of vibrant red over the, uh, the brown or red. For this method, I uh, instead of doing a wrap around the whole sword, which can make a kind of nice finish um, as well, I'm, I'm going to try a single wrap on this blade. 
which is to just kind of wrap a single piece of uh, leather around the whole guard, around the whole grip, and then uh, stitch stitch it together, basically. The stitching isn't necessarily going to do much holding together. Most of that is done by this contact cement here. Again, trying to work your way around it gradually, making sure that it's nice and smooth and flush. Again, this is getting activated by the pressure, so it's good to squeeze as you go. And then trim off any excess with a scalpel or a very sharp knife. Cool, and now I'm just going to kind of do some faux stitching. It's not faux stitching because it's real stitching, but it's not really holding anything together. But it's just uh, some stitching or running, uh, running down that seam where the two pieces of leather meet to make it appear that that's how it's obviously been, been bound together. Um, I'm using very soft cotton here, so it's not going to kind of rub on your hand as you hold it. Because we are all delicate as lapers. Cool, and then I'm going to hit it with some Dirty Down, which is just a Dirty Down spray. This just uh, helps kind of weather that grip. Dry brushing silver to some elements of the sword as well. This is just where the kind of finishing stage. And you can push this as far as you want to go, depending on the weapon. Obviously, I want this to feel a bit more kind of dirty and old and, and worn a bit. Because it's kind of like a baddie sword. It looks pretty baddie, um, which is great. So yeah, this sword is huge. It's five feet long, which is, I think, the, the top end of how long it can be for the Empire rules, which is fine. That's what you want to do. You want to push it to the limit. And yeah, I'm very happy with how this um, has turned out so far with the paint job. Now I'm going to hit it with a flexible-ish clear coat. Uh, this just helps prevent particularly those dirty downs and those kind of paint finishes from being affected by the next layer, which is the Isoflex, which is obviously quite a corrosive material. Uh, absolutely wear a mask, probably should have worn long sleeves. Um, so be careful with this product. It's very bad if you get this on your skin and absolutely terrible if you smell it. So yeah, be careful here. Um, apply that nice and not too thick over the whole thing. Um, again, this is sort of clear coat just helps prevent that from reacting with the uh, the paints underneath. And the next day, it's kind of pretty much good to go. It's a little bit tacky at this stage, so what you want to do is you want to either hit it with a silicon spray, which um, mean, maintains the kind of shine. Some people love that finish, uh, particularly on obviously metal weapons. Um, but I prefer a kind of bit more of a duller finish over the whole thing, so what I use is I use talc over the whole thing. Obviously you still get the shine through from the metallic paint, but you don't have that kind of, like, over the top in my opinion, very kind of shiny. I mean, it's still pretty shiny, you can see. So, dulling that down a little bit with the talc has helped a little bit, and that obviously stops the tackiness. There we are. It's kind of finished. It's good to do. I can't get this in a bloody frame. I need a, a thumbnail. Watch out! Cool. So, uh, this is uh, the finished piece. It's already been to one event, so it passed by the check, which is great. Um, it's five feet long, which is the maximum length a two-handed sword can be. I can't even get it in the frame. It's big. Yeah, cool. So that's it. Done. Um, it's probably a bit more kind of a baddie sword than I initially set out to do, but my mate's very happy with it. Um, it's a little bit lighter than I kind of perhaps would have wanted, but that still makes it safe. Um, all in, happy.